Welcome to Booth Bay Region Historical Society's first virtual event. I'm Executive Director Amy Keithen. We believe that history is for everyone. So expanding our programming to the virtual world made sense to us. It makes you, um, it, it makes it so that no matter what the weather, you can enjoy um, some history at home. And also I'm hoping it allows some of our seasonal residents um, to participate a bit more when they can't be here with us. I'd like to thank everyone on this call and everyone who watches this very much for supporting this program. And a special thanks to those of you who donated. Um, that tells us that you want more of these online talks um, and we really appreciate that. If you didn't donate, but you'd like to, uh, you can go to our website at www.boothbayhistorical.org. Unlike many of our talks, Tonight's program isn't specifically Booth Bay focused, but that's deliberate. As we move forward and grow and strengthen your historical society, we want to make the connections between Booth Bay and the wider world more known. We know how special this area is. We need to show other people as well. So this talk focuses on the extraordinary life of a woman who only tangentially touches on the community. She was one of the first women to summer on Squirrel Island. Through that, she's one of us. An even stronger connection, however, were her efforts for women's suffrage. In, uh, in the background behind me here, there is a newspaper printing of a petition that says, we, the undersigned women of voting age, respectfully petition you to vote in favor of women's suffrage at the special election of September 10th, 1917. There are hundreds of names there, and the peninsula is very well represented. Um, many of the names are actually familiar today, and I know that some of the people on this call actually have um, relatives on this um, petition. We are incredibly fortunate uh, today to have author Anne Gass speaking to us about this topic that was so important to local women, and in particular, that summer resident of Squirrel Island that I mentioned, who just happens to be her great grandmother, Florence Brooks Whitehouse. Anne is the author of Voting Down the Road, Florence Brooks Whitehouse and Maine's Fight for Woman Suffrage, which was published in 2014 and on which this talk is based. In 2021, she published We Demand the Suffrage Road Trip, which is a novel based on the true story of an epic cross country road trip for suffrage that took place in 1915. Anne is a frequent speaker on women's rights history. She served on the steering committee for the Maine Suffrage Centennial Collaborative. As the main coordinator for the National Votes for Women Trail, she led an effort to erect seven suffrage markers around Maine, which is fantastic. She currently serves as chair of Maine's Permanent Commission on the Status of Women and is a town council member for Gray. Uh, her writing is inspired and informed by her activism. So this isn't just words. This is um, it means something to her, and it makes it even more wonderful to hear that passion. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Anne to share her screen and get started. Oh, thank you very much for that great introduction and uh, and for having me do this talk tonight. I I want you to know that I I really embody that the history is for everyone because in fact. I uh, was not trained as a historian, and um, so uh, I uh, I had to, you know, this is a DIY -D -D uh, kind of history here, but um, I fell in love with Florence and the suffrage movement when I started researching it, and, and it, I haven't stopped since. Um, so, yes, this is uh, kind of, I'm, I'm going to talk tonight about... Um, Florence, I'm going, my goal is to introduce you to her and to the work that she did for suffrage. And I'm going to start with a poem that she wrote. Um, and it's a it's one she recited in 1917 uh, in, in front of the Judiciary Committee of the Maine State Legislature when she was up there to advocate for the uh, statewide suffrage referendum that was this, you know, held on September 10th, uh, the focus of those signatures you see on the on the wall behind Amy. And um, and so here's the here's the poem it goes. I have no quarrel with you. 
but I stand for the clear right to hold my life, my own, the clean, clear right to mold it as I will, not as you will, with or apart from you, to make of it a thing of brain and blood, of tangible substance and of turbulent thought. No thin gray shadow of the life of man, your love, perhaps, may set a crown upon it, but I may crown myself in other ways, as you have done who are one flesh with me. I have no quarrel with you, but henceforth this you must know. The world is mine, as yours, the pulsing strength and passion and heart of it, the work I set my hand to, women's work, because I set my hand to it. So that's a, such a cool poem. I, I didn't find it until I was in my early 40s. I really knew nothing about Florence. But to me, it, it just captures the essence of who she was. She was a, a feminist and a suffrage leader, uh, but she was also an artist and a musician. Um, she was a community activist in her own right in Portland uh, and a devoted wife and mother. She was also a deeply spiritual person. These were all facets to her personality and and she drew on all of them as she did her suffrage work um she, i plucked her uh out of relative obscurity um she'd been completely forgotten by the state of maine and by the suffrage you know she was written out of suffrage history for reasons i'll go into later um so i had to do a lot of research to find out about her and i just wanted to to note that the the title of the book voting down the rose refers to the fact that the rose was the symbol of the flower symbol of the main of Maine's anti-suffragists or antis as they were referred to and the suffragists used the jonquil or daffodil so in voting down the rose they're vote they're defeating the the anti-suffrage forces and um that's um you know kind of a the big focus of the book of course um here's just a quick uh overview of the sources that I used in writing the book. Uh, Maine Historical Society, Florence's papers are there. Actually, my aunt uh, had seven boxes of her papers and donated them to, to MHS, so anybody can see those. Um, Library of Congress has the National Women's Party papers, and uh, so the photos in this slideshow are mostly from there, some from the family's collection as well. Um, I looked through newspapers um, in Portland, in Lewiston, um, mostly Portland, all the Portland papers, um, a little bit the Lewiston Journal and some the Kennebec Journal as well, uh, UMO Library and State Archives, and then other suffrage Maine and, and U.S. history. I really, I was starting from scratch here. I didn't know anything about this history. I'm embarrassed to admit. I didn't know about Florence. I didn't know about women's fight for voting rights. Um, I didn't, I was pretty ignorant. So it, it took me 14 years to research and write this book. And, you know, as I raised my own family and ran a business and that kind of thing. So, um, but it was, it was a, a labor of love and I'm, I'm so glad that I persevered with it. Um, so I'm just going to start uh, by doing a bit of a dive into Florence's background, because I think it does help to illustrate why she was such a successful suffrage leader. Um, <clears throat> she was born in Augusta in 1869 <clears throat> this is her family home at Seven Spruce Street. She was the fourth of five children and the family's first girl. Um, and uh, her her dad was Samuel Spencer Brook. Um, he Brooks he was a successful businessman. Um, he had a hardware store down on Water Street in Augusta, and dabbled in shipbuilding. And um, and uh, this is her her mother was Mary Caroline Wadsworth. Brooks um, and uh, distantly related to the Henry Wadsworth Longfellow family. Um, I, I love this picture because Florence was said to to uh, to have this sort of intense bright blue eyes, you know, this this blue eyed gaze, and you can get a flavor of that in this in this uh, photograph. And I I I like to think of her of this kind of gaze as she stood in front of the Judiciary Committee and recited that poem to them. Uh, and it's her younger her younger sister and the youngest child in that family was uh, Marguerite, whom they called Daisy. Um, now the, the the White Houses uh, 
as as I'm sorry, the Brookses and the White Houses actually um, were among the earliest families to uh, uh, establish the summer colony on Squirrel Island. And she spent a lot of time there growing up. I love this picture because uh, it, you know, we tend to think we, we often see our, our ancestors or our, our former leaders, you know, looking very dignified and sober. And this is a, you know, here she is, she's young. Uh, that's her brother, Percy, who's cranking her head around to look at the camera. And uh, and they're just kind of goofing around. They're on squirrel. And next to Florence is her um, her husband. I don't know if they were married. I'm not sure what the date of this photograph is. Um, and then um, that his name was Robert Treat Whitehouse. And, and I'll talk about him in a minute. And then I don't know who Mutton Chop Sleeves is there at the end. But oh, my God, can you imagine wearing those in the heat of a Maine summer? I don't know. Uh, so uh, Robert also grew, was born and grew up at Augusta. Um, they, I think they probably went to, uh, went to public school together. And then, um, oops, oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. There we go. Uh, his father was appointed, his father was William Penn Whitehouse, who, and he was appointed to the Supreme Judicial Court in 1890, uh, and he served until 1913, the last two years as a uh, chief justice. So uh, he came from a well-connected family, and he himself became a lawyer. He went to Harvard, I think, and then and then became a lawyer after that. Uh, I, I actually, before I move on to the next photo, I, I just wanted to to um, talk a little bit more about Florence. She went to finishing kind of a finishing school that was affiliated with the Episcopal Church called St. Catherine's Hall in Augusta. And after that, I think she could have gone to college, but she chose not to. Um, and she, instead, what she wanted to do was study music, drawing, art, and uh, and writing. And so she went down to Boston and found some kind of masters, uh, as she referred to them, to study with and, and kind of to be her tutors. And then in 1892 and 1893, she took off for Europe and did an extended tour of Europe and the Holy Lands. Um, I think traveling by herself, I, she may have hooked up with some other people while she was over there. I know she spent an entire winter sailing up and down the Nile with um, the McCormick family whose ancestor had invented the Reaper. So they were quite wealthy and I, I don't know how she got connected with them, but um, the family sort of myth is that Robert, uh, heard that that she had developed some sort of romance over there in Egypt and um and he sailed for Egypt to bring her home and I I don't know I've never been able to find any evidence that that happened but what I do know is that if she didn't want to come home and marry him she wouldn't have done it because she had very firm ideas about uh sort of women's equal well not, not so much women's equality but having an egalitarian relationship and if he hadn't been agreeable to that um she wouldn't have married him um, so they settled in Portland um, in 1890. They married in 1894 and moved to Portland. This is their their house at 42 Deering Street. It's still there. And I'm happy to say it has a marker, a suffrage marker in front of it. Um, and they uh, Robert went into private practice initially. And then later he was sort of involved with the Republican Party. And, and um, he later became uh, the uh, district attorney for Cumberland County. And um, they had three kids. Florence was active in her own right. She was um, uh, she was a member of the Rossini Club, which is a famous music club, one of the oldest in the country. And uh, she started a writer's group. And she and Robert, before the kids came, collaborated on writing plays and performing them, uh, directing them, performing in them, and putting them on for charity from, you know, Merrill auditorium in Portland on up the coast. I'm sure they did it on Squirrel as well, if there was a venue. And um, and then the kids started coming along and he got busy with his work. And so he really encouraged her to turn the plays into novels. And so in, um, in 1902, she came out with The God of Things, which was based on one of their plays published by Little Brown and Company. Uh, and she did the all the illustrations for this book and and this is just one example of them 
uh, both of her novels were based on in her travels in Egypt, um, that both were romances of the Sudan is how she referred to them. And uh, they were, I think they were, you know, pretty popular. Uh, she she participated in marketing them. I, I have her scrapbook still. And and uh, and you, she she must have joined a clipping service because I have all these clippings of, of reviews of them from all over the country. Uh, and then um, and she came out with a second book in 1904. It sort of coincided with the birth of her, her youngest son, who was my grandfather, Brooks Whitehouse. Uh, and then, you know, I think she was pretty busy with the kids for a while. And then when he was four, my grandfather came down with polio, which was, of course, was a complete disaster. And, and um, you know, uh, just a health calamity. And, and uh, she appears to have dropped just about everything and devoted herself to his care. And uh, because her her scrapbook just stops at that point in 1908 and doesn't pick up again till 1913 when she joined the suffrage movement. Um, and I think she, you know, that's also characteristic of her and of women at that time, because there were no like visiting nurses or something like that. If, if people got sick, if people in your family got sick, it was the women who took care of them. And um, and they were expected to drop whatever they were doing and and uh, and you know, become nurses. Um, so, you know, here we are, I'm sorry, this is such a fuzzy photograph. It was, it was blown up from a really tiny one, but here we are in 1913. I, I'd like to think of this as her, her, uh, suffrage activist photo. Um, and I, I think this is around the time that she joined the suffrage movement. So at this point, her two older boys were away at boarding school, um, and or in college, and and her youngest son was also uh, at boarding school. He was his he he did thanks in large part to her ministrations, um, become you know he 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 became much healthier. He was able to play tennis and hunt and um, do all kinds of stuff. He played the piano and he had, he had quite an active life, and he always credited her for that. So uh, she was looking around for something to do. She'd been involved in Portland's progressive movement and she decided to join um, the National American Women's Suffrage Association and the Maine Women's Suffrage Association, which would have been the state affiliate. And just a quick background on suffrage uh, history, um, if you're not familiar with it, uh, NASA, um, and by extension, it's state, state affiliates all favored the state by state approach to winning suffrage. Um, winning it, you know, getting a federal amendment to the Constitution, this, to the U.S. Constitution was a secondary strategy. Um, and, and they, um, so that what they would do is they, you know, like what happened in Maine in 1917, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, they would persuade the state legislature to agree to, um, you know, to, to pass by, in Maine, it had to be a two-thirds majority of both houses um, and, and pass a suffrage uh, amendment to the state constitution and send it out to the voters for approval. And so you can see that that's a huge amount of work. I mean, first you've got to lobby the, the legislature and then you have to persuade the men in the state, right? Because women still can't, they can't vote yet um, to vote in favor of the referendum. And it was, the men were very sort of devious. Sometimes, you know, Maine had, Maine like other states had to mount you know, a number of campaigns before they were finally successful in 1917 and getting a statewide suffrage referendum. Um, and uh, and then, you know, and then they they unfortunately it coincided with World War One and, and a lot of the, a lot of other stuff that that made it hard for them to organize. But another feature of, the, of NASA was that they were they were mostly like proper middle class women. They um, they favored this non-confrontational, non-political approach to lobbying, and and uh, they accepted fundamentally incremental progress on this on suffrage. It'd been they've been working on this for about sixty seven years, or no, about um, yeah sixty five years or so by the by the time Florence joins the suffrage movement here, and um, and you know only about nine or 10 states had enfranchised women through this method. It, it, you know, it was a lot of work for not a lot of gain. But um, the presidents, I, I like to show photographs of, of famous women 
uh, because we don't often see them. But um, so Anna Howard Shaw would have been president when she first of uh, NASA when she first joined, and she was president uh, from 1904 to 1915. Then she resigned, and Carrie Chapman Cap took over. She had been president of NASA earlier and then returned in 1915 and led it to the very end. So these are the women that Florence would have been working with at the national level. And um, Florence, because she was a good writer and she could organize herself, she was, you know, a good kind of uh, time, good with time management as she'd had to be in order to write novels and, and uh, raise her family. Um, and she uh, was well connected politically and 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 socially and and um and she was very comfortable in front of an audience because she'd done all those those plays um and so she it just made her a very uniquely qualified suffrage leader and they were really glad to see her show up and um she uh quickly became chair of the legislative committee and they almost got a suffrage referendum through in 1915 and she continued to lead the effort and got it done in 1917 um and uh, her her husband, my great grandfather Robert, he was also a big suffrage supporter, as had his his dad had been as well. And he um, created the Men's Equal Suffrage League in 1914 and 1920 because by this time in the suffrage movement, the women really just ran their organizations, and the men, if they wanted to create a parallel one, would do it separately. Um, and so they. You know, as an attorney, he was in a position to advise them, and and his board was made up of all of these well-known, up-and-coming, uh, you know, future governors, future uh, legislators, um, that kind of thing. So, so he was well connected, and uh, uh, for and and that suited that work as well. That was a big support. Um, so here's I I believe this photograph is from 1914 in May. Uh, May 2nd, uh, NASA organized this big um, national rally in every state. Suffragists were supposed to have these automobile parades. And I, I so I think that's what this is from. And there's no photograph. I mean, there's no date on this photograph, but it, they're on State Street in Portland here. I just love this photo. And um, so, and Florence is in the middle in that white kind of raincoat there. So everything's going along pretty well, you know. They're they they're a little mad they didn't get it done in 1915, but they're they're really hopeful. They got close, closer than they'd ever been. So they're really hopeful for 1917. At that point, they couldn't they couldn't introduce that until the next legislative, uh, the next you know, start of the next biennium. Um, so then, but in 1915. Um, some other suffragists from a completely different startup group or upstart group um, called the Congressional Union came knocking at her at Florence's door in um, the summer of 1915, and they had started just a couple of years earlier. The federal amendment was their sole focus. They they weren't going to monkey around with the state stuff, um, and they were entirely comfortable with using controversial methods like picketing the White House, and like holding the political party in power accountable for failing to move the federal suffrage movement through Congress. And they estimated that uh, there, because there were a bunch of states by now, even more than when Florence had first joined, who had enfranchised women, um, that there were 4 million women voters in Western equal suffrage states. And if they could harness their votes, <clears throat> get them to vote as a block, they could determine the outcome of uh, elections, um, especially the presidential election coming up in, in 1916. They were kind of, they didn't accept this incremental approach and, and they didn't care who they pissed off. Um, they were, they wanted suffrage now. Um, and in 1915, the Democrats had control of both houses of Congress and the presidency. Woodrow Wilson was president and he was gonna be running again, uh, for, running for reelection in 1916. So what they were going to do is target the Democrats and, and they were going to tell voters, all of these women voters, we don't care who you vote for. And in those days, there were multiple political parties, um, but just vote against the Democrats because they kept us out of suffrage. And um, Alice Paul was the president, um, of, uh, she and the founding president and remained president of what becomes the National Women's Party later on at the end of 1917. Uh, straight through to her death in 1977, but here she is 
in her younger days. And uh, Lucy Burns was her kind of co-conspirator in this and um, it was also an amazing suffrage activist. Uh, and um, so this is, this illustrates the strategy they're going to use. And this is from the, the Congressional Union uh, around 1915. The white states all have enfranchised women. And uh, that's where those 4 million women voters live. And the, the modern young woman voter is coming to the aid of her benighted Eastern sisters who are in kind of the black pit of despair because they don't have the right to vote. And so she's coming striding across the country. And um, and a uh, couple things to note about this photograph. I mean, the modern American woman voter is, she's young, she's beautiful. She looks like a goddess, really, if you think about it. Um, and she's white. And that is not an accident because the suffragists knew that in order to get the suffrage amendment through Congress, they were going to need the help of some of the Southern former slave states. And, um, and then for ratification, because of course, three quarters of the states have to ratify an amendment to the U.S. Constitution, they were going to need some of those Southern states as well. And if they emphasized that they were enfranchising, they were planning to enfranchise all women, including black women, um, it, you know, it would have been a non-starter. So it, it, uh, this is one of the reasons why the, the suffragists have been, you know, labeled as racist. And, you know, I'm certain that many of them were, but I, I also, uh, that, that was the political reality they were dealing with. And, and, um, and so it was, it was a very sort of difficult situation. Um, so, that's uh that's where we are in 1915 and i just wanted to point out it wasn't just the suffrage states uh florence as in her role as um a chair of the legislative committee for misa for the main women's suffrage association had written to um the you know the delegation the congressional delegation inquiring about their interest in a and an amendment to the U.S. Constitution enfranchising women. And he's, he writes back, I am not in favor of an amendment to the Constitution, which would force woman suffrage upon states which do not desire it. And here he says, the state of Mississippi has a white population of about the same size as the state of Maine, but it also has about 1.2 million Negro population. And uh, enfranchising the male Negro population forced a most difficult situation upon Mississippi and the other Southern states. And I'm not willing to aid in increasing the burden which has been thrown upon them. So this is unbelievable to me. I mean, Maine has this tiny black population at this point. Um, and, uh, but this Northern Senator is saying he's not willing to uh, enfranchise women because he's through a federal amendment because uh, of racism. So this is what they were up against. It's just kind of an illustration of it. Um, so here's Florence. This is actually uh, one of her press photos for the Congressional Union um, that they asked her to, to take. And um, so she she sort of ends up becoming chair of, of the, the main branch of the Congressional Union at their organizing meeting in August of 1915. And uh, her colleagues over at MISA are really just alarmed by this is probably the best way to put it. And they're a little mad at her because they don't like the Congressional Union. Congressional Union, uh, you know, is thought to be this very radical organization that will harm the cause because they're willing to piss the men off. And um, and Florence says, says to them, you know, don't worry about it. Uh, when I work on state stuff, I'll work with the Maine Women's Suffrage Association. And when I work for the Congressional Union, I'll, I'll, I'll work with the Congressional Union on the national stuff, and I just I'll keep them separate. Um, and she, but she joined the National uh, Council of for the Congressional Union. She was appointed to that, and um, she really got quite involved with them. And at this point, she was Maine's most effective suffrage leader. So Misa had no choice but to to kind of put up or shut, you know, and shut up uh, because they couldn't afford to lose her. Uh, they were really hopeful they were getting close to getting a suffrage referendum and they 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 needed Florence to make that happen. Um, so she, she starts off working with them and and um, everything's, she sort of manages to walk this tightrope for some time. And then um, in 1916, uh, 
Alice Paul hires Florence to go out to Wyoming to campaign against President Wilson in the 1916 presidential election uh, campaign. And so this is October of, um, of 1916. She stops in Chicago on her way out to Wyoming and takes part in this action against Wilson, who's in town to deliver an important foreign policy speech. So the, the orange arrow there, gold arrow, shows where Florence is in the crowd. But she had actually led this procession out of suffrage headquarters down the block or, or down to stand in front of this building where, where Wilson was to speak. And there, by the way, there were a lot more women there. Um, this is only half the photograph. There's a whole other photograph of, of women lined up. They're not saying anything. They're just letting their their uh, you know signs speak for them. Um, Florence is the sign that Florence is uh, helping to hold there or, or right next to says, "Why does Wilson seek votes from women when he opposes votes for women?" Because Wilson came into office saying he hadn't really thought too much about women's suffrage, and then once they persuaded him to think about it a little bit more. He decided that he really uh, thought that it had to be one state by state. He was a Southern Democrat, you know. He he didn't want to um, enfranchise blacks and more than any, any more than you know anyone else did in the South, and um, and it took a lot of uh, hard work to change his mind, and that's part of what this campaign is about. Um, and so, what I don't know if you can see, there's a there's a mounted policeman. Um, off to the edge of the crowd. And then behind the women lined up there are a bunch of men. And as soon as Wilson entered the auditorium, um, the men attacked the women and tried to grab the signs out of their hands and, and destroy them. And the women didn't want to let go. They get they get pushed around, shoved around, some thrown down into the street and, uh, you know, their clothing's torn. They sprain their wrists. My dear, uh, this is just unbelievable i mean respectable respectable uh, respectable middle class women did not brawl on the streets of chicago or anywhere else and um and so but that's what was going down and then the the mob uh chases them back to their headquarters the the congressional union's headquarters and stands outside and heckles them for hours and um and of course the the suffragists were excited about this because that meant they could uh, give publicity to the this terrible treatment they'd suffered for just demanding voting rights. And the next day it was front page news all over the country, um, including back in Maine, Florence had a, she had a, um, a suffrage column in the Lewiston Journal. So she sent back an eyewitness account. So from here, she goes off to Wyoming. She spends a couple of weeks traveling around giving two speeches a day and she gets to uh, do a quick side trip to Yellowstone. Uh, she's pretty excited about that. And, you know, the, the suffragists campaigned against Wilson on the under the slogan, he kept us out of suffrage, uh, of course, because he was campaigning under the slogan, he kept us out of war. Um, in the end, she comes back to Maine, he gets reelected, uh, but by a narrow margin. And, um, and she comes back to just this very frosty reception back in Maine. Their, her former colleagues at, at Misa are just enraged uh, because she had discovered, she, she'd done the, the count before she left for Wyoming that they had enough votes in the legislature finally to get a statewide suffrage referendum. But the her Misa colleagues said, if you're lucky, we'll let you address envelopes and lick stamps in this campaign because you are way too controversial and you're, you're going to hurt our cause. Uh, and <laughs> the only way we'll change our minds on that is if you resign from the Congressional Union and denounce their tactics. And she wasn't willing to do that. Um, so she uh, she they basically kind of kicked her out and uh, she ended up being able to work on it through um, this other new organization called the Suffrage Referendum League of Maine that a bunch of her friends created um, and, and, and appointed her president sort of in absentia that she didn't know this was going to happen. And then they came to her house and told her what they'd done and asked her if she'd serve. And she said, absolutely. So um, that's how she gets to work on the 1917 suffrage referendum, because, of course, she can't do it under the auspices of the Congressional Union. Uh, they're only focused on the federal amendment and, uh, and Misa has kicked her out. So, uh, so she, she's, you know, the, so the, the state legislature passes the 
uh, or the referendum measure in February of 1917 and sets September 10th as the voting date. Um, but it's a long, cold, snowy winter uh, followed by a wet and cold spring so the roads don't dry out till later in the spring. Uh, so they can't get out into the rural areas. And then of course, by the time they can, uh, the US has entered World War I. In, um, in in April of 1917. So it you can see they just start right out on their back foot. They It's, it's really um, difficult because all of these women who'd said, we're going to work full time for suffrage or I'm going to devote half my time for suffrage and I'm going to give all my spare money to suffrage and this and that and the other thing, as soon as the U.S. enters the war, they all pivot to the war effort. And um, and they're not really available to work on on suffrage, and they're raising money for the Red Cross and for you know selling war bonds, and and uh, and they're just there's no money for the uh, suffrage referendum. So uh, Florence also joins the war effort because her two older sons. Uh, I don't think she's excited about war. In fact, later in her life, she she worked hard to, uh, um, to you know, to oppose war. But her two eldest sons uh, joined the fledgling Air Force. One flew, her oldest one flew dirigibles, and the the middle one flew bombers. And uh, both of them were uh, ended up in Europe. And um, and it was a really harrowing. Uh, to be the family member, well, be harrowing to be part of the Air Force because more men died in training than they did in combat. I mean, the, it was very unsafe. There was no ground-to-air communication. Uh, they they really had no idea what they were doing. They were literally kind of inventing the whole thing, as uh, inventing the planes as they flew them, and almost. And so it was. It was. Uh, she joins the Red Cross and becomes the head of their information bureau uh, because there was no. Um, there was no VA then, so there was no communication vehicle between families of service members and and the service members themselves. And and um, so if somebody, if your loved one got killed or injured in England, uh, you know, how would you get his effects home, or how would you get him home? And and it was the information bureau that helped uh, step in and and kind of resolve some of those issues. Um, and but she also had the suffrage campaign to run, and but it's, so it's really not until about mid June that she starts getting active on suffrage, and she starts, um, you know, she does a bunch of of uh, debates, she does um, talks at various um, locales, uh, she writes letters to the editor, she's out gathering signatures on that same petition that you saw there at the start. Um, and she's bringing in other speakers from other states uh, who, you know, people might be more willing to come and see because they hadn't heard him before. Uh, she's doing whatever she can. And all the, this all this time, the MISA, the Maine Women's Suffrage Association folks are are just hammering her and, and, and the Congressional Union and the press uh, for their their controversial tactics and um, and really focusing on that instead of joining forces with her and helping to win the suffrage referendum. And that uh, contributes to its later problems. But here's one of the things she managed to get done. Um, she had a friend named Frederick Freeman who was a, a cartoonist, but also ran a, a mill in, in uh, Wyndham, I think. And, um, and this is, he would come up with these posters and under the pen name, Will Arcady, and um, and then he would, uh, they would post these posters in the in the bay windows of their uh, suffrage office on Congress Street, and um, and then they would also get published in local newspapers. So the Grange, the Federation of Labor, and Good Government are all on the yes side, the pro suffrage side. Uh, prejudice, vice, and the high cost of living are on the no side. So choose your side, and everyone pull. Here's another one. Uh, which I, I like because it it sort of shows, um, uh, you know, kind of where where women were at that time. Eight million women are earning their living outside the home in the United States um, at this time. And President Wilson calls upon American women to mobilize for industry and agriculture. And uh, even Lloyd George in, in London says the allies can't win without the women. And but here's the this older woman as carrying this this uh, sort of raggedy uh, doll that says women's place is in the home bogey. And so it's it's sort of showing that uh, the, the um, 
you know, this, this cartoon is, is named another junker for the scrap heap. You know, it's like women's place is not in the home because women are, are already out of the home. And um, so that's just another example of there. I think there were 10 or 12 of these and really, really fun. Um, this is one of my favorite things. I think it's so cool. They, um, I, I found in her correspondence that this letter from Florence to Captain Williams of the, who uh, captained the Nelly G, um, which of course would have, uh, would have connected her for, or, you know, ran trips back and forth daily from Booth Bay Harbor to, to uh, Squirrel. And so she, she writes to him in, uh, in August of 1917, I want you to fly this um, banner from the very highest point of your flagstaff, just under the American flag, where the aunties cannot get it. And when it wears out, I will give you another. And um, so she's not really able to spend much time on squirrel that summer because she's so busy but um she she makes sure that the suffrage flag is uh is flown from the nelly g um so one of the things that made her uh florence's work and, and the suffrage's work much harder in maine and, and and elsewhere in the country is that in january of 1917 alice paul um starts picketing the white house so at first uh they have these purple white and gold banners that have some um, some some writing on it, um, you know, Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage and those kinds of things? And they they their their uh, offices, their headquarters were not far from the White House, so they would walk out of the White House in procession and and stand on either side of the White House gates, which you could do in those days. I mean, the president used to actually tip his hat to them as he. Um, left and, and came back from his daily golf game. And um, and they'd stand there. And again, they wouldn't be saying anything. They'd just let their banner speak for them. Um, but, and, and initially people treated them with some condescension and just like, oh, those, those women, you know, uh, they're just creating a fuss and bothering the president. But once the U.S. entered World War I, this was a big deal. And uh, people really didn't like that they were, uh, in some cases, kind of making fun of the U.S. president, they were they were interfering with a war effort, and it be, and after the Congress passes the Espionage Act in June of 1917, I mean they could be arrested for violating the Espionage Act and spend some serious time in jail. Um, that never actually happens, but you can see. So so one of the one of the things they do is they start saying, well, you know, the time if we quote the president, then how can quoting the president be uh, treasonous. So here's an example of, of uh, they're quoted President Wilson, who says, the time has come to conquer or submit. For us, there is but one choice, and we have made it. And um, so uh, I think this is P Alice Paul right here holding this banner coming out of their headquarters. Uh, and but it's by by June of 1917, the suffragists start getting arrested, and this is a big deal. They get arrested, they get sent to Occoquan prison, um, some of them for longer uh, longer sentences. I mean, I think initially it was just you know a few nights or a week or something, but um, but Alice Paul gets three months in prison, and she goes on a hunger strike, as did there are several other women, and they were forcibly fed and. Um, really mistreated she lost a ton of weight and uh, she was not a big person to begin with and um and they finally her lawyer uh has to file a writ of habeas corpus to find out where she is he didn't even they couldn't they didn't even know where she was and um and he finally got her released and they they you can believe that the suffragists made the, the congressional union made a big fuss about this um, and and but then they started up in August of 1917 with this Kaiser Wilson banner where they're kind of rudely saying to the president, have you forgotten? First of all, they're comparing him to the German Kaiser, which was, you know, there was such enormous uh, anti-German sentiment during World War One. You, you can't even believe it. Um, it was kind of like the 50s and communism. And so here they're saying, have you forgotten your sympathy with the poor Germans because they were not self-governed? 20 million American women are not self-governed. Take the beam out of your own eye. And um, so this this banner almost didn't make it out of suffrage headquarters before the, the mob, the waiting mob tore it apart. Uh, but they had spares. And um, and this one cost them, uh, you know, caused a lot of controversy, including in Maine. And um, and so uh, ultimately, here here's a 
headline from a Portland paper uh, where it says praises women who picket White House, but says they defeated suffrage in Maine. They they lose the the suffrage referendum two to one. It's not even close. And uh, here at the bottom, you can see that Congressman Hersey says bearers of the Kaiser banner um, are according to Kaiser Wilson banners have the highest motives, but they you know they're he really faults the Congressional Union. And and who's the most visible representative of the Congressional Union in Maine? It's Florence. And so she's kind of. You know, she gets the stink eye, as you can imagine, and she and Robert take off or uh, they, they they leave town for a little while. But she comes back uh, completely unrepentant. At the end of 1917, the Congressional Union changes its name to the National Women's Party. And um, here's her new letterhead. A fair exchange is no robbery. And um, that she proudly announces it's the National Women's Party main headquarters is her new address, which is at 108 Vaughn Street in Portland's West End. Um, and they keep working on it. Um, it's it's hard during the war. Uh, you know, they also um, we end up with, uh, you know, the 1918 flu epidemic, which is just insane. Um, and, and you can see this is comes from the Portland paper on the Portland Press Herald, uh, where they did a retrospective in 2018. And um, you can see here uh, the, uh, you know, the there were only a few deaths early on, but it quickly mushrooms that over 1800 people died in Maine of the flu in one month alone. And so this was a serious problem and it really cramped their style when it came to, to suffrage organizing. They couldn't have meetings, they couldn't travel on public transportation to uh, to get to meetings or to, um, you know, or to, to go out and organize. And, and so this was a big deal. And, um, you know, Florence continues to, she organizes some big mass meetings and she's continuing to write letters. But uh, I, I think this is one of my, uh, one great example, and I have this in the book. Um, in, in 1918, she's got two sons in the war effort um, and she gets a, a, she gets a fundraising appeal from the Red Cross and, uh, and and there are all these constant demands from the government for women to work in the factories and take over the jobs that men have left behind. And she so she writes this letter to the editor in, the, in a Portland paper, and and she, she alone really is is you know really su publicly supporting the 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 pickets and the the National Women's Party, and she says. In my heart, there is a deep resentment against my country that at this time, when it is demanding the greatest sacrifices from me and from hundreds of thousands of mothers the country over, that democratic principles be advanced in Europe, it refuses to recognize women in that democracy at home. A resentment that in all President Wilson's splendid oratory upon human liberty, there is no inclusion of women as human beings, that women who are responding with sons, money, and service to the government can be mobbed without protest, arrested, and sentenced and placed in prison by the government which is taking their sons and their money and their service to wage its wars. The treatment of the Washington pickets will forever be a blot upon the United States government. Whether or not we believe their action is wise, there is no question, but they are within the law under the First Amendment of the Constitution. And uh, she, again, I mean, she's she's the only person that at least that I was able to find in the papers that I looked at um, who supported, you know, publicly supported the suffragists. And um, so she does end up going down to Washington um, to to picket and um, to join the join the pickets. Uh, she had refused at first, in part because she um uh, you know knew that it would be prejudicial to the uh, to the suffrage campaign in in. Um, 1917, but also her husband Robert didn't want her to do it. I don't really know the, her his reasons for asking her not to, but he was so supportive of everything else that she was doing in the suffrage movement that that she decided um, that uh, you know she would she couldn't say no. Um, she would have to um, she would have to agree to that. So um, she she it wasn't until later that that I guess she she got his permission to go down. Um, so finally, in um, in 1919, uh, the federal amendment gets through Congress. Um, it gets the necessary two thirds votes in both houses. And this is a telegram that that Florence sends to Alice Paul. I'll have to read it for you because it's hard to read. She says, "Congratulations and rejoicing 
Suffrage victory is due to you and your undaunted fate, splendid vision and untiring devotion to the cause, and proud to be the lowliest of your disciples. Admiringly and affectionately, Florence Brooks Whitehouse. So, um, and there, here we are. Um, she's. This is at the signing ceremony when uh, Maine goes ahead, gets goes ahead, and and uh, finally. Um, uh, ratifies the 19th Amendment, which happens uh, in November of 1919. Uh, Maine is the 19th state to ratify. And uh, Florence is there standing behind uh, Governor Carl Milliken as he signs it. And uh, that's her buddy, Grace Hill, next to her. And uh, these other four women are all representatives from the Maine Women's Suffrage Association. But a couple things to notice about this photograph. Uh, one is that he is... Uh, signing the document with with uh, a, the purple, white, and gold uh, quill that had been furnished by the, the National Women's Party. They created it and sent it to state from state to state to be used in the signing ceremony. And uh, in using that, I believe that he was signaling that he knew who it was that got the suffrage, rat, you know, suffrage amendment ratified in Maine. There was a, a huge, um, you know, effort, last minute effort to tank it and it almost worked. And it was Florence and Alice Paul who were up in Augusta twisting arms, making sure that didn't happen. And I, that's, I read about that in the book. And then he also, after the uh, ceremony was over, he gave all the women souvenir pens, but uh, everybody else got these sort of ordinary steel pens and Florence got a, a pearl handled gold pen, which I, again, I think signals his knowledge that um, you know, she was she was the the primary leader, and uh, and perhaps it was a nod to her outlaw ways. Um, so uh, this is the language of the the Nineteenth Amendment. If you haven't seen it before, uh, the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any states on account of sex. It was seventy two years. Uh, if you date that from the, the 1848 uh, Seneca Falls Convention um, that was organized by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and friends before this language got into the U.S. Constitution. And honestly, thank goodness it did, because I would could see there might be some states now that would, uh, if it was still just up to the states, that would be rethinking whether women should vote. Um, and... Uh, just a quick note that the, the National American Women's Suffrage Association becomes the League of Women Voters the day that uh, suffrage is ratified, which is not until August of 1920. Um, and, uh, and so the Maine Women's Suffrage Association became the main, um, you know, main branch of the League of Women Voters. The National Women's Party didn't change its name. It didn't need to. Uh, suffrage wasn't in the name. <laughs> and they go on to work on things like the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, Here's the language of the Equal Rights Amendment, which you can see looks pretty similar to the 19th Amendment. And uh, Florence continues to serve as, as chair of the main branch of the National Women's Party, but she uh, gets back into painting. Uh, excuse me, Ro Robert dies in 1924, which is huge, uh, you know, huge loss for her. And so it takes her a while to kind of get back on her feet. Um, but she gets back into painting. This is a, a Monhegan, and here's another one of Monhegan. That was one of her favorite places to paint, but she did other landscape paintings as well. And um, and she got in heavily into the peace movement. She um, was a member of the Women's International League of Peace and Fr Peace and Freedom, and um, and also a number of other groups. Um, and had a had a weekly. Um, broadcast or, or show radio show on WGAN and in, in Portland uh, advocating for the the League of Nations and um, and for world peace. Um, so she stayed busy right up to the end. And, um, right, you know, here she is with her middle son, Robert, uh, in her later years. She died in 1945 when she was 76. And I, you know, when I first started learning about her, I, I really... I, I was excited about the suffrage history because I, I didn't know anything about it. Um, but then I, I became, as I got to know her better through her own writings, and, and there's a lot of her writings in the book, by the way. I had I was able to find a lot of correspondence. So a lot of the book is kind of written in her voice. And um, and 
you know, I started to realize that hers was a very complete life. Um, she she did all of these things. You know, she was a novelist. She was a wife and mother. She did the suffrage thing. She was, you know, worked on the Equal Rights Amendment. And that she would, I think she would have seen her life as a very complete life as well. Um, she lived a life of conscience and a principle, um, sometimes in the face of considerable opposition. Um, and uh, I, to me, I mean, she... she she was a great role model uh, at a time when I was kind of her age when she started the you know, working in suffrage uh, with a young family and and um, and other interests. And uh, she sort of taught me how to manage my time and to and to uh, try my hand at many things and uh, and to remind me that the work I do is women's work because I choose to do it, not because anybody else tells me what women's work is. So I think I'll I'll kind of close there. And uh, here she is. Uh, this is the photo they used for her obituary. And, uh, you know, if you're concerned about what's going on with women these days, here are some actions you can take. Uh, um, I love talking about this stuff, as you might be able to tell. So I'm happy to talk to anybody anytime about this history and other women's rights history. And, and uh uh, so there's my book, We Demand, that uh, Amy referred to, and, and you can learn about it on my website, and um, there's some more, more information. So I think I'm going to stop there, and uh, we can go to questions if there are any. There are, and actually, your, your, how you ended that um, was exactly perfect um, for uh, a question, um, but uh, a particular question that I'm going to ask you. Uh, but before I do ask you that, I just want to say thank you. That was amazing. Um, that was just really wonderful. And um, we're so grateful that you're, you're able to do this for us. Um, I particularly found the um, the art newspaper article by Senator Johnson like about racism. That was so stark. And it puts it into context in a way that it's hard to understand if you don't see things like that. That's right. Uh, That's my, my reaction, too. It's like, yeah. <laughs> So if someone asked a very pertinent question, are there any lessons or inspiration that you think we can take from the suffragette movement to apply to the present day? Yeah, I would say perseverance, right? Uh, you know, they worked so long and so hard, so unbelievably hard to, to get this done. Um, so uh, I think that's one of the reasons why we have to be vigilant Um I do this work, I, I do a lot of this kind of stuff in part uh, out of, you know, kind of a, a penance for having been so ignorant of this history. Um, not entirely my fault because I, I'm like, like me and many of you may not have been taught this history very well in school, but, um, but also just taking for granted the rights that women had fought so hard to gain and, and just taking them for granted. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, being vigilant and and uh, and joining forces with others to uh, to prevent further rollback in women's rights, especially around reproductive rights right now, um, is is critical. But they used uh, everything at their disposal. I mean, uh, from feminine wiles early on when that was all they had to uh, to humor, to uh, appeal to patriotism, to, uh, you know, all just whatever they could think of, they used. They sent they sent uh, politicians valentines on Valentine's Day and had these little clever poems about suffrage. So, um, you know, don't give up. Um, that kind of um reminds me of, 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 I've heard this more than once when um, people talk about um, uh, social clubs or, um, you know, organizations that women were in. Um, the one in Booth Bay was called the Monday Club and um, the owner of the house that we current, currently occupy for our museum, uh, whose name was Elizabeth Freeman Reed, was really involved with that and president of that club. Um, but these were part of the, you know, the the National Women's Federation of Clubs. But still today, you hear people say, "Oh, those were like tea parties, though they didn't do anything." Um, but work like what you've done here shows us otherwise that 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 organization was incredibly important. Is there is there a way that you think we can, um, you know, how can we combat that perception today that those were just, you know, social clubs where they had tea? Uh, I, you know, I, I think 
finding their agendas and minutes if you could if you can put your hands on those is one way to do that i mean oh and and you might not be able to get, actually get hold of the minutes but um the newspaper society columns usually uh, covered their meetings and so and then they would often say um you know so and so was a speaker or here was what they you know focused on during the the meeting and i you know i think there was a tendency to um uh, you know, kind of diminish their work in part because they would do things like, um, you know, they always opened the um, the meeting with with songs, sometimes with prayers. Uh, often they had uh, a, a member uh, do a, a musical program as part of it, and and they it was often a silver tea or something like that, you know. So that was kind of what. Um, you know, led people to think that maybe they weren't doing anything meaningful. But believe me, if they had announced to their husband, I'm going off to a suffrage meeting, you know, probably he, you know, and especially in the early days, he might have said, no, you're not. And um, so, but they could say, I'm going to a silver tea at Mrs. So-and-so's house. And uh, and so uh, he, he was absolutely fine with that. And and I'm sure that they they did some, did some work at those meetings. Uh, that actually brings me to another question, which was, um, what did Florence's husband think of this? I mean, he must have supported it in in some way, but did it at all um, impact his reputation from his career? It sounds like he wasn't really working a lot of the time that she was really heavily involved, but he still must have had a reputation. Um, how did that work for them? I think it worked okay. I mean, he was very supportive of uh, of her work with, even with the Congressional Union or the National Women's Party. In fact, when Alice Paul and the other national organizers came to Maine, came to Portland, they always stayed with the White Houses. And um, because they had this big house on uh in Portland's West End. And um, and and you know, she she writes to Alice Paul at one point when Alice is trying to get her to come down to DC and pick it, and uh, she says, you know what, uh, you know, I'm I can't because he's asked me not to. Why don't you come to Maine and persuade him otherwise? And um, and uh, he he uh, but he put a thousand dollars. Well, they the between the two of them, they put a thousand dollars into Maine's 1917 suffrage referendum campaign, which is equivalent to around twenty four thousand uh, dollars in in today's money. So um, you know, they he put in significant. Uh, resources. Plus, he was the chair of the Men's Equal Suffrage League, and and um and did some work that way. So, I but I think the picketing might have been a bridge too far for him, in part because he was uh you know he was an attorney, and and uh you know perhaps that might, he thought that would be prejudicial to his ability to support the family, you know. So I, that may have been one of his reasons why. We have someone raising their hand, and it is our illustrious president, Dana Wilson. Um, Hi. Dana, you're unmuted, Hi. Dana. <laughs> Hello, um, and this was so great. What a fascinating talk and a piece of history that I um, admittedly don't know much about, which is ridiculous. So thank you for educating me. My daughters were in the background sort of listening a little bit here and there. So um, it's good stuff. We've come a long way. Um, I'm the president of the um, board of the Booth Bay Region Historical Society. And thank you so much for, for doing this for us. This is really awesome. Um, my question is, um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, you hear about the, the, the pickets and the police and women going to jail and, and all of that. What might the suffrage movement have looked like in a rural community like Booth Bay? Like, what might the temperature have been in the community? I know it was a 72 year long <laughs> um, time, but just sort of um, any any ideas? Yeah, I, I would imagine that uh, there were the occasional uh, parades, suffrage parades, like that one that happened in, in on, on May 2nd in 1914. Uh, there, uh, you know, they might have done that locally. There were certainly silver teas or, or you know, or, or meeting the meetings of women's clubs uh, where suffrage was discussed. Um, and uh, and and really, from like from the time that Carrie Chapman Cat took over of the the National American Women's Suffrage Association, they they started to to change their tactics a little bit more. 
And um, they would have these suffrage uh, schools where um, they would teach women how to organize. And um, and so they that was sort of moving away from the old women's club model towards a much more politically, you know, like a political action committee or something um, and teach them how to fundraise, how to how to segregate um you know, audiences by interest and 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 what sort of themes you might use to go after them. Um, so they might have been discussing that. Um, I would think that um, you know, certainly that you saw the 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 petition campaign was huge. And obviously somebody was really busy up there gathering petitions. And I, they would have had speakers come and speak at local churches or at the Boot Bay Opera House or someplace like that, you know, to to talk about suffrage and why we need it. Great. Thank you. That was wonderful. I think we're going to end on one more fun question, um, which is, do we know if the um, the tricolor feather pen <laughs> still exists or is it lost to history? You know, I, I think it is lost to history. I've been down to the National Archives and uh, it's not in the National Women's Party papers. Um, um, and it's not, you know, nowhere in the Library of Congress. I, I, I think it did get lost to history. Maybe it's in some state uh, museum somewhere. I don't know. Yeah, it's. I, I looked hard for it. Uh, and on all the women who got arrested for picketing and, and jailed, um, jailed for picketing, I should say, all got these um, suffrage pins that uh, these brooches that looked like a the the door of a jail cell. And I, I looked really hard through the family, the house that Florence had at the end of her life, um, the family still owns. And so I went through that house from top to bottom looking for that pin and, and I couldn't find it. So uh, I don't know whether she ever got one. She was never, there was a family story that she was arrested and jailed. Um, it may have been, may have happened in Boston, but I, I have never been able to prove it. Um, so I don't know if she deserved that pin, but um, yeah, it's, it's too bad. And uh, I, I just, I think one of the cool things is that the these suffrage petitions got preserved because when we were working on the um, the marker project, we um, were able, we only got five markers from this donor and we had to, we wanted to do two more, one that would honor uh, native women and also um, um, African-American women. And so there is one in Bangor that honors the African-American women. And the way we tracked them down was through the suffrage petitions. Um, we, we, we cross tabbed the, or, you know, we cross correlated the, the uh, signatures on the petition to, um, to the census. And so, and the census listed race. So that's how we found out uh, who, who had signed it in Bangor. And um, so uh, it's, this is just a treasure trove of a history to, to find these. I mean, you could probably, find out some more about suffrage through any of these people who signed it. Yeah, wonderful. Um, that question came from a museum professional, so we'll expect her to be researching that and trying to find that pen. Um, Good. And she also asked um, whether or not you would, uh, whether or not you'll be considering um, donating the scrapbooks to an archive or museum someday. Um, and yeah. I imagine you'll maybe get them to the right place. They might go through a couple generations first, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I do. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm, um, I do need to sort of think about that a little bit more because I, uh, what I used, I, I, I had photocopies of all the correspondence and everything, and um, that I found all the newspaper articles, and I put them in these three ring binders and, um, and in chronological order, and that's how I managed to sit down and write this thing, and, and, um, <clears throat> so the, um, the main women's writers collection, I think at UNE has uh, expressed an interest in them. And, and I, uh, you know, Maine Historical Society, I also have a good relationship with them and, and I'm sure they would take them as well. So uh, I just have to figure out where they're going. <laughs> okay, excellent. Well, I think that's gonna do it for this program. Thank you everybody so much for joining us. Um, stay tuned for our upcoming in-person speaker series, which is gonna happen over the summer. And of course, if you're a member, you'll be getting a notice soon about our annual meeting, which is going to be uh, at the end of May. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Yeah, and thank, thank you, you, Anne. Thank, thank you. you.